this video was originally recorded at the annual Buddha and the Yogis retreat at Menla in Phoenicia, New York. To learn more about this annual program, please visit menla.us. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So I'm so happy to see you both. Actually, we met in Boulder last month, and so it's like old, just like normal. <laughs> uh, Boulder is really nice, actually. I understand why they love to be there. And uh, what? On mute. Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah, can you hear it now? Is that better? Yes. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I'm so happy to see them both, and I'm so happy to see all of you. And uh, as you know, this is Buddha and the Yoginis. Actually, rather than just yogis, it's yogi needs. I have a thing that I write because in Sanskrit, you know, the masculine is supposed to stand for masculine and feminine according to Pandani or ancient Sanskrit rules. I mean, that's their excuse. That's just, their like, excuse. just like in English, <laughs> yeah, mankind you know, means both. You know. But anyway, right. that is technically the thing. So whenever I see yogi in a translation from Sanskrit or Tibetan, I write yogi slash ni. Yes. Then long yogi <coughs> And so this that's what I've written this time. Buddha and the yogi ni. Some way there it is. Oh yeah. Yogi ni. So it so it what happened? So it means either one. And I'm especially happy. So Mary is joining us now. And Mary, actually you're the leader now. We're just following along. We we have been all along. You know? That's the way it is, no, right? But, but now you are exposed. To the so I think you should, you know, welcome to you both and thank you for coming down the mountain to this lower mountain in the rainy summer that we've been having. And uh, and um, it's I uh, turn it over to you. <laughs> now she's deferring to me. <laughs> what? But say something first, yeah, just as a good omen. Is it right? The yogi Ni speaks first. That's the idea. Okay. That's my idea. It's not on. What? As soon as the mic works. Hello? Just a nut working. Yeah. yeah, okay. Is that working? Yes. yes. Well, thank you for coming. And I'm delighted to be part of this. We, we talked about it and with a whole workshop on the Buddha and the yogi Ni's we decided, and I feel ill-equipped, but other than my gender, to be here. Um, but that, that's a, actually a really good reason to be here, is my gender. And so my role this week will be to sort of bring what these two wonderful men uh, have to offer down to earth. <laughs> Which those of you who work with Richard and me know that's my role. And, uh, <laughs> and also to really look at how the feminine embodied version of what is being presented can, can shine some insight onto this. So we really welcome you all here and hopefully we can go away with some deep insights but also some information on how to take this into our practice and into our lives in this important time in history uh, where this kind of information is really important, more so than we know. Thank you. Okay, over to you, Richard. <laughs> Are you functioning there yet? Yeah. I'm functioning. Oh. <laughs> it's like a heart monitor. <laughs> I should clip it on the other side, maybe. Okay. That's sensitive. This is called a nadi. <laughs> and the sound you hear is nada. <laughs> Which means. This is all part of the uh, program. <laughs> How's that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, 
S seems to be currently that the, the uh, yoginis um, tend to do the practical thing of making things work by getting them to relate to their environments, you know, to the actual circumstances, uh, which are usually quite vast and complex. And so, oftentimes, you know, in the, I think in the, the male-oriented lineages, which um, you end up with uh, multiple yoginis, uh -huh. uh, although that is switched, uh, Later on, in some interesting texts, they switch that where there's, you know, multiple yogis surrounding mm -hmm. uh, the goddess, mm -hmm. the yogini. Um, but you know, the the complexity of just practical life, and uh, certainly this is true, you know, in our current culture. Mm -hmm. So uh, the the rise of the feminine mm -hmm. uh, is. It's coming. <laughs> and so, um, let's see, should we get into it? Um, I brought with me um, one text called the, the Devi Mahatmyam, uh, which is the glorification of the Devi. Now, this is a, probably a fourth or fifth century text, and it was one of the first actual philosophical presentations of the Shakta tradition, mm -hmm. uh, which is the part of the, the, those traditions that lie just outside the orthodox traditions, mm -hmm. in which what had been going on forever already, thousands and thousands of years, um, on the edge of any tradition you get the, the um, people who don't quite fit in, like, like us, <laughs> and, and particularly when you have an orthodox tradition, one of the, the nice things about orthodoxy is right outside of it, that's where you get interesting people who don't quite, they have to re reinterpret everything to make it work for them. And so uh, I've always uh, said that, you know, when you go to, you know, I lived for a year in a place called Vrindavan, Mm -hmm. uh, in North India, and I've just occurred to me recently that the word vrinda means a swarm, like in a swarm of honeybees. Uh -huh. And so it is the forest. Yeah. yeah. So it's the forest of honeybee swarms, mm -hmm. which are yoginis, and little yoginis that come. <laughs> and uh, but being there, you know, there are so many temples and ashrams, uh -huh. and each, you know, full of, you know like gurus and like this guy and, and uh, you go to each one and each one is the best one and then they're always talking about their neighbors down the street which they're going don't go to those guys they're actually crazy <laughs> and then but we got to be ready at any moment yeah, yeah but, the local uh, but what I always found was the the nice thing there was all of the alleyways between the temples and uh -huh. the ashrams because that's when you'd run into like just miscellaneous yogis yogis and sadhus who were just like just radiant you know <laughs> sweet uh, nice people with no agenda they didn't try to like <laughs> capture you or get your credit card number. <laughs> and uh, so I've always, you know, at that time, this idea that uh, um, the real juice flows in between things, mm -hmm. the, um, flows in between traditions. Even when you make a tradition out of flowing between traditions, you're going to still make a counter tradition, uh -huh. a tradition that flows between the Absolutely. traditions. And so it just keeps, just like water. Uh, it just keeps flowing uh, in between things. Um, and that's the yogini thing. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to articulate. Anyway, so this is a, and the reason I chose this yeah. is because it was short and sweet. 
And there's only the fifth chapter is the only one that I really uh, am very familiar with. And so on page eight here we have, the, and this is just called the uh, the Devi Tantrika Sutam uh, uh, is the name of this. And it's just these. And the nice thing is that they're easy to chant once you get to the fourth verse down because it's all repetition. And that's probably why I remember it. Um, and then we I, we sent out a PDF uh, for those of you into the electronic that's right. cyber world. And there's the, the PDF is the entire daily life. Right. Right. Um, and because then you get to see all of the bloody, gory, wild <laughs> stories um, that really um, express a lot of my current mood. You know, like when I, <laughs> and I thought and I used to think, oh, how could you know they're just such angry people? You know, these demons, and then they. Such. Yeah, and then recently, ever since November, I started to, <laughs> I started to uh, really go, ah, you know, I have to confess, you know, but if I check the news too often, I just like, I know, it's a big question. I start roaring, and, and so what to do with this, and the, the power of these emotions, mm -hmm. um, Something to be to be dealt with, to be uh, mm -hmm. to be not to be denied. Mm -hmm. uh, some of us have uh, evolved right, through the denial of emotions. Oh, sure. Know, some of us guys, you know. Sure. Like, <laughs> you know, you know like, what emotion? You know? <laughs> Mary can probably tell you stories. <laughs> but recently, I've had to, you know, just start dealing. Like, I know. It's kind we're, of nice. We're not yet Venezuela, but we're headed that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment. Hopefully we'll see the light yeah. as a collective. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, this Mahadi begins with all, all the weapons that oh, she's that's holding the word. In, the, in the first verse of the yes. first chapter. It's all these weapons on the cover. You hear they got the weapons there. So, so so I said that, so I have this other eight page thing that I think they should have sent you just today. I I sort of redid things. I'm terrible, you know. I look at an old thing that I translated and I start retranslating it, <laughs> and I get very delayed. But um, so this is Tara, you know, and then there are 21 forms. This is a very famous thing. All Tibetans know this by heart. Uh, Tibetan ladies especially, but men too. And they recite it. Oh, if I, I want to turn it on, it'll make that noise. Turn yours back on. There you go. So, uh, that, uh, you know, so, so this we hope to memorize this by the end of the retreat. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little of it in Tibetan, but I never did memorize it in English. But these tw these twenty one uh, verses uh, show her as fierce, as dominating, as peaceful, and as uh, prospering, you know, and, and expanding, growing, increasing for ritual activities. And so that's, and then she has a, have a special one here that is to Sri Devi, which is Kali. And strangely, Kali is the special protectress of the Dalai Lama and of Tibet, actually. She has a soul link that's in Tibet, up to this amazing red mountain, in front of which is like a, one of those offering cakes. But it's a mountain, but it's all red, it's a copper mountain, in, the, in the central Tibet. I went there two times. Well, some of you may have heard Laurie Anderson sing, uh, singing about her near-death experience on the second trip that I went there. I took her, I went to her, took her along, and then she had a terrible altitude thing, and uh, thought she was dying, thought her head had been put off somewhere else, and was saved by a woman with a mule, a guy who had a mule, uh, which is Pendel Lama's vehicle, it's a mule, yeah. made of eyes, you know, Kali, that particular form of her Kali. Anyway, so I just that's trying to parallel Richard's thing, and then I have some other Dharma things, and uh, in the afternoons I'll be teaching that. And um, the whole question about how many of you here have ever done some sort of a tantric initiation, you know, just any kind of ceremony or anything? How many? 
Uh, I can't see you. Mm -hmm. Not many, or a small percent, maybe five percent. Okay, thank you. So that's always the, the ticklish thing. But so the Wittara is safe, though. You can always deal with tolerance. Okay. Some of the other goddess things you have to have kind of an initiation for. When I said, I don't do that. No, that's not my thing. Doing rituals. So that's, that's what we're doing. Anyway, the, the mode of doing this in the Buddhist thing is interesting. All the great Buddhist adepts, you know, the 84 of them, there are 84 Mahasiddhas that they call. Well, there are thousands probably, but those are the special ones. And 80 of them are males. Four of them are females only. But every one of those males, almost every one, their main guru was a female. But then they didn't write the books, you know, so then they're not known. But all the male ones were ex-monks or something, and they had uh, literary knowledge when they were Brahmins, and they knew how to write Sanskrit and stuff. So they, or and Prakrit, they they started writing uh, uh, bhakti things in Prakrit. They were the first uh, bhakti poets in Prakrit. So so the thing is, the voice of the female has been buried in patriarchal India forever, and um, so we thought we would try to work on that. Is it a good idea, you think? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> and the, in the tantric thing is what's interesting is that some of the very high yogas have a male visualizing themselves as a female. You know, creating subtle body form and meditation of themselves as female. And vice versa. And females uh, visualizing themselves as males. Male, de male Buddha forms, male deities. So the sort of gender flexibility and fluidity is a, a part of that tradition, actually. Oh. Interesting. So that's the thing. I created a kind of scandal. Did I tell you that when we met in Boulder? In Norway, last summer, where they had something called, that meets every three years, the International Association of Tibetan Studies, where they have a lot of Tibetologists, they call themselves. And, um, <laughs> And, uh, but they have some people from Sanskrit and Hindu, you know, a few general religion people, but mostly focused on something connected to Tibet. So I gave a talk on the consort thing against all the people who have written books and papers about how the women are exploited by all the yogis, you know, and the women are just some kind of like tool, you know, or some facility, you know, that they, they use so they can meditate, you know, in male-female union, you know, this sort of advanced tantra. And uh, so I gave a a talk entitled, Being a Tantric Consort in Ancient India Could Be a Career Path. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I explained, you know, the social setting and how, you know, a lot of those, you know, the parents sell them to brothels and things, you know, in the lower classes, you know, in the cities in India, like they do today, they did in ancient times. And, and so the, the untouchable, the Chandala Consort is prized, you know, but then they, are, they, they join that thing, then they become like a group of tantric adepts who apparently are nice to them, and then they are educated, get educated, and, so forth, and then they become yoginis. And then they work with, uh, some of them may become adepts themselves, you know, undoubtedly they do. And I wonder, I, at the time when I wrote it, I was hoping someone in the audience would be, had studied the Kumari thing in Nepal, which I think is left, you know this thing about the Kumaris yeah. in Nepal? Yeah. So they have these young girls who, um, who, uh, who serve as goddesses until their puberty, but nobody knows what they do. They just bring them out and they walk around or something, and then they're honored afterwards. After they become uh, uh, fertile, they no longer serve, and they marry and they have regular lives. But uh, I wondered if that's a vestige of the tantric communities in Nepal, probably. But there's no, I don't know, nobody had anything to say, and I don't know that. So if any, I don't know if any of you do what actually the education of the Kumari is, you know, what they learn and what they study. About the 64 arts. Really? It's what they learn the 64 arts of passion? That's what came to my mind. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, but these, these are high arts. Mind, so, right? yeah. But I don't know if that was the Kumaris or... Yeah, I don't either. I don't either. But, the, but, but yeah, they're supposed to know that. Also, Dharma. And also the Dharma they're supposed to know. And what I, one of my clinching points to them was I read some passages about, you know, the very high-level thing where ordinary sexual release and so forth is extremely re... the, the, the energies are diverted in, through the chakras, and etc. 
and you could possibly be just an ordinary sexual partner or practitioner and do that, you know. You, 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 one, of the, one of the partners was just having sex, the other one could not have the poise to meditate. And I showed that from text, you know, how it would be, it would not, so therefore they couldn't be just using somebody, in other words, as a partner to follow. Yeah, yeah. Both have to be at the same level when they get really advanced. And they don't need to do that. So it's very disappointing to people who want think Tantra is just wild parties. <laughs> <laughs> Some people in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> we do. So, so that was a little bit of a scandal. I, I enjoyed it. Huge. <laughs> they had to shut down some of the other uh, panels during the same time because everybody came to that. <laughs> You have to be old to be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a fact. Otherwise, a lot of people have written how Tantra is this horrible, terrible. One of my great friends in India, Professor Lalmani Joshi, who was a, he was the head chair chairperson of the religion department of, in, in Patiala, in you know, Guru Gobind Singh, in that, which was a big adept place. The Punjab was a big adept uh, center, and. Uh, he loved Tibet and the Dalai Lama, and he was born on the same day as the Dalai Lama. He was a Brahmin, but his children's names were Dharmakirti, Maya, and Avalokiteshvara. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but he was himself very permanent, like very Brahmin, you know. But yet he loved Buddhism. But then when I would mention Tantra, he'd go, Oh no, Bob! Don't talk about Tantra! No! <laughs> Dirty things, no! Don't tell me about it. I love those Tibetans, but not Tantra, no! And I think it has a little bit that... Uh, that reputation? That reputation. Yeah. Which it doesn't deserve, actually. To, I mean, there are, of course, people who misuse everything, you know, but the real Tantric adepts is really, really jewel of the thing, you know, actually, both Shaiva and Buddhist, I think. All the Buddhists think the Shaiva are not quite getting it together, and vice versa, vice versa. no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. Although at the highest level, they do say, like Nagarjuna's famous uh, five stages thing, he says, he says, um, the adept, you know, at this level doesn't care, Vishnu, Vajradhara, Buddha, Shiva, that, that's all the same to them. You know, they say, but they have no discrimination, or not like the institutional, orthodox religions. They, they go beyond that. Luckily. Yeah, the, the Hatha Yoga traditions, what? the Hatha Yoga traditions, which are Tantra. Oh, I think so. Uh, recognize many of the same siddhas as the 84 Yes, you, you guys have 80, right? Yeah, something like that. You didn't have a lot the four of them overlap. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have the four females. <laughs> the problem is they don't want the four females. <laughs> oh, no. And I think if you asked any of the siddhas, what, which, which do you belong to? They yes. look at you like an idiot. Like, I think so. What are you talking about? If they really pass a certain stage, yes. I think so. On the other hand, Dalai Lama always, always likes to think about how one sees all the other paths as leading to the, to the goal. Like you can see, you know, anybody, Jews, Christians, Muslims, they all can reach nirvana. They don't need an ism, you know, to do it. But on the other hand, then when one is self-practicing, one picks one thing and does it. That's a, that's a very important thing. Like Tibetans have a saying, they say Indian, uh, Indian gurus, yogis, they have one initiation, one deity, and hundred cities. Tibetans have hundred initiations, a hundred deities, and no cities. <laughs> no attainment. <laughs> Too many deities, which I think is a little bit the tendency in Tibet. A little bit. So, uh, um, I'm just, and nowadays we are doing a lot with Kala Chakra, and Kala Chakra may be the, uh, it's quoted by Abhinava Gupta, and I don't think, Nanda, what's his name, his guy before him, Nanda, Abhinanda something, it was his, his predecessor in Kashmir. So the, 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 remain, the remaining Buddhist tantric traditions and Buddhism in Kashmir and the Shaivite tantrika were totally in, very, very interconnected. And the Kala Chakra in particular, 
when it first was imported into Tibet. Uh, under the legend that it had just come to India from Shambhala, which is a sort of Sanskritic country somewhere in the north of the planet. Um, uh, the Tibetans didn't want it because they thought it was sort of some kind of Hindu thing, because all oh, Hindu deities are in the mandala, etc., parts of the mandala. And female Hindu deities, especially, part are like Mrs. Brahma and Mrs. Vishnu and Mrs. <laughs> Rudra and Mrs. Ganesha. They're all there, actually. And especially the speech mandala, where the feminine is connected with speech and it's like a big thing. It has three buildings in Kalachakra, body, speech, and mind, and actually five. And the penthouse is great bliss. And um, so the, the females are very dominant. They're in all three, but they're dominant in the speech, speech one, which has to do with intelligence and communication and so on. Right? Which is, goes back to, connects with Vedic thing, right? The Savitri and... Yeah. They are, that's the names of those deities are Savitri and Kalachakra. Oh, in the Kalachakra. Yeah, yeah, all those uh, Vedic, uh, okay, 64 we, of them. We have a chant in here at the beginning. What? Which is Rig Veda chant. Oh, good. To Saraswati, who is the Bhakti. Oh, good. Where is that? Why don't you read it to us? Here we go. Brahma Devi Saraswati, Vajivir, Vajinivati, Dinama. Vidya Vatu Vak Devya Namaha. Oh, yeah. Saraswati. The stream of. Saraswati is the famous river. Mm -hmm. And she's the. Sarah is. She's the flow. So she's the flow of them. And, uh, but Vak is the language. And language is the very principle of. Creation. Everything is language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an Indian thing. Everyone knows that, though, in this group, right? You all know that? What? About language? I don't know. And India, and the Vedas, and what God is? Huh? No. You, do you? I don't no. want to repeat it. No? Just say no. Say no. So yeah, this one writer, one writer was very, a um, scholar, did a very, very nice thing in Karl Potter in the, in the, in the West. If we have a big crunch, then we, and there was a period between the big crunch and the big bang in a cycle of universes, which they sort of allow nowadays the multiple big bangs is kind of the fashion among the cosmologists. They were really at first hankering for the one big bang so it would like fit with Genesis. <laughs> Not that they're culturally provincial or anything. Uh, but, but then pretty much everybody realized there may be another one some other time since the Big Bang happens for no reason as far as they understand and therefore something that happens for no reason could happen any time. <laughs> There's nothing to prevent it. And, and anyway, um, so we would imagine the universe, the elements are dissipated, right? Conservation of energy, they can, the material elements of our cosmologists, you have like nuclei, protons, or whatever it might be, neutrinos, whatever you know, bric-a-brac they have, you sort of have the idea of like little, little, little billiard balls all dissipated around where they can't bump into each other and make things. Sort of would be the idea, it's because it's matter. You know? But in India, in the cycle between emergences of... Uh, what's the matter? Yes. Here, can we move your mic onto your outer shirt? What? Let's move your mic onto your lapel. Every time you move, your outer shirt hits. There we go. Oh. <laughs> uh, the, thank you. The, uh, I forgot what I was saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In the, in the thing, the vowels go away. There's no vowels. And only the consonants are, start lying around, and they can't go anywhere because there's no vowels. The vowels, list, that's what the end of the universe is. So instead of matter lying around, you have syllables unpronounced syllables lying there. And then the one, the great vowel, the Brahma, comes as the first vowel, which is short, ah. That's like A, right, but we, it's really ah, right? And so ah comes, the first vowel, and it sweeps into the universe from the indestructible, the anahata shabda. And it picks up the consonants, 
And then as you have ma and ga and ta and da and na and whatever it is, and then they become seed syllables of phenomena, and then the universe emerges. So you know it's interesting that you know the Christian scripture that thing in the beginning is the word the words of, in Egypt. There are those who do say there were Buddhist monasteries in Alexandria in the first century, around the time that that uh, John uh, the Gospel of John was written. So they, that word thing may be, may come actually from India. Actually, could very well. There were Jain. There's supposedly Jains in Mesopotamia, and uh, and uh, Buddhist. There were no Hindus at the time because they didn't have monks, and uh, until later they they were against. You know, you could be a student, but you weren't supposed to be a monk, right? So so that's the thing about language. And then that, uh, the vowels usually are feminine. Sometimes they make the vowels not masculine, but usually the vowels are feminine in the tantras and the, and yeah, the consonants are masculine. masculine. And uh, so they're like, like males tend to be, they're somewhat inert without the stimulus, <laughs> the movement, the energy of the shakti. <laughs> <laughs> and for example, in the Tara, the, the Buddhist form of Tara, uh, she is said, she's a Buddha. And her legend is of someone who, who was a woman who was immensely high in Bodhisattva, practicing incredible samadhis, etc., etc. And then one of her colleagues, a male guy, said, Oh, you're really fantastic, doing great. Next life you can be reborn as a man and become a Buddha. <laughs> and she said, Oh, that's so boring, all these male Buddhas, you know. I'm going to become a Buddha as a female. Forget about you. And she did. And then, however, she manifests as a bodhisattva everywhere to help beings, as well already being a Buddha, actually. And Avalokiteshvara and Banjushri, these there are other bodhisattvas quite well. And, um, and so Avalokiteshvara is said to be the incarnation of the infinite and universal compassion of all Buddhas, although it's supposedly acting like a bodhisattva. But Tara is the incarnation of the miraculous activities of all Buddhas, the miracle working of all Buddhas. So she's much more active and dynamic. And the one that I particularly like, a great one, where, where Avalokiteshvara was meditating and he made a vow, if I get discouraged when I meditate, you know, that all beings become happy and they all become enlightened and they all become free and they all learn to do their ashtanga, whatever. <laughs> and if I get discouraged, I want to be just ripped in pieces, you know, like made like, didn't show that he really meant it, uh, which he did. And then at one point he's almost getting discouraged and he starts to weep, looking at the suffering of the world and uh, looking at the condition of the White House. <laughs> and, and the Kremlin and so on. And, uh, and, but then each tear turns into one Tara, the green one and the white one. And the white one is the peaceful healing, the green one is the fierce and sort of intervening one. And they say, oh, don't get discouraged and cry. You know, of course you can't do anything but just wish for the best. <laughs> Hope for the best, that's all you can do. But we can take care of it, so just take a break. Don't worry about it. I like, I like that very much, the two of them, green and white. So we deal with that. But there are then 21 forms that we look at. Like, and, and there's a Durga form, too, sure, with weapons, stamp, stamps your foot. He says this and that. There's, it's a, you'll see it in the, in the mantras when you read it, which we'll do tomorrow, too. So... Uh, So Tara's what? Tara is usually when she's sitting, she has one foot out. She? That's the green one. Oh, the green green Tara. Has yeah, one she foot puts out. a foot down because she's because she's somewhere standing. So there are some of the red ones there because they're stamping on their feet, you know, they're like oh, yeah. and so on, but and dancing and so on. But uh, the, the seated one, the green one, has one foot down, meaning she's about to get up. And the uh, white one with the with her eyes on the soles of the feet, she's like uh, healing and she's she's meditative posture. So the two most famous ones. But there are red taras, there are yellow taras, golden taras, all kind of brown taras. This is the black taras of every color. Pretty much. Like I think Kali and Durga and although do they think of them as one deity in India, maybe they think of them as multiple or depends on the person. Depends on that's right, that's right. But these 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 types think of them as one.
Mahatyam. They think of them as what? Yeah. The, the Madhyam and Mahatyam? Yeah. You know, of course they are. In, in a way, in Buddhism, what they are is the Pratyaparamita, transcendent wisdom. You know, the wisdom that realizes the true nature of reality. That is the female is wisdom. That is the thing. Males, as I said, hoping for the best. <laughs> the females are, have wisdom. And uh, so the, ultimately, they are Prajnaparamita, the, the um, transcendent wisdom goddess. And she has many forms because that is how, you know, like people are born in human form by the power of previous karma, of their own previous karma and uh, evolutionary momentum. Uh, but then to be born into enlightenment, when the mother of all Buddhas is the Prajnaparamita. So I think this must be like Shakta, like the goddess, you know, the great goddess. They are. But, but of course, in Buddhism, the emphasis is not on creation. Uh, the emphasis is on liberation. They consider creation as what's going on. You know? Then once liberated, there's a creation of spaces where others can be liberated. But liberation is the focus rather than creation. They don't think their creation can be blamed on any one person. We're all in it together. We all made a mess together, basically. No one person is in charge of all of it. Not even the President of the United States, even if he's a billionaire, fake billionaire. <laughs> so, um, any questions? Well, can you, you know, you can, uh, where is Justin? Justin! Where's the moving mic? Uh, we need the moving mic so people can ask questions. Since this is the opening evening, you can express what you're hoping for. I can or ask questions. Any questions? But we want to get the mic. I don't know where our sound man went. Oh, is that it? Oh, good. Okay, and hopefully when it's clicked on, they're not going to have an explosion. <laughs> How do I click it there? Oh, good. Okay, questions. Don't be shy. Yeah. You hold hold the on. mic right against near your mouth like an ice cream. <laughs> Come on. We need the mic, but it's working. Mary has it, but you should do that. Whenever you're in. Yes. Uh, I guess uh, from the perspective of both of the traditions, I was hoping you could elaborate on the concept of wisdom and how it falls along the path and the process of each tradition, practical, practically or transcendentally. What, what is that? Yeah. How wisdom. How what? How wisdom falls along the path. How wisdom falls along the path practically or transcendentally. Right. Well, in, in Buddhism, or I think in general, all, uh, all six darshanas pretty much have the idea that, the Indian idea is that the human being can understand the universe, That's a, which is a not a European idea. And there's not some god who understands it, but the human being can understand it. And Actually, human being, except in some cases of extreme dev devotion, bhakti sort of thing, human being has to understand the nature of reality in order to be free of suffering. So liberation is or moksha, uh, you know, nirvana, etc. It's obtained by understanding the nature of reality, which works out to be nirvana. <laughs> luckily, it's very luckily, and uh, supposedly. And I'm hope, still, I'm hoping for the best. <laughs> and uh, and so, so wisdom, that's what wisdom means. Wisdom is not, and wait for in Buddhism, wisdom is associated with a 16-year-old, sassy-looking kid, who's orange in color, and holds a book in one hand, and a sword of, which is a sort of critical intelligence, of discernment, seeing through delusions and things, cutting through delusions idea with the flaming laser tip, you know, that's what we call Manjushri, uh, which means the gentle, or Manjugosha, the gentle voice to one. And uh, so that's a symbol of wisdom, not the old graybeard who's like seen a dozen winners and like, yeah, the groundhog will come out and this and that, and <laughs> whatever, you know. That's eternal, not, or the television pendant, what? It's like eternal youth. Like like who? Eternal youth. Yeah, eternal, Kumara Bhutta it's called, yeah, one who was the honor. So wisdom is seen as 
And that's why wisdom may not be the best word, actually, for prajna. The Sanskrit root of it is nya, which means to know. And uh, like the Greek kno or gnosis is the same root. And then pra means super. So prajna means super knowing. And uh, is that what we think of as wisdom, or do we think of wisdom as a kind of resignation to like, you know, uh, nothing, you know, I can't do anything. I'm afraid that's what we think wisdom is in the West. And it's, it's identical in the uh, different, there are many different traditions, that's why it's hard to, but yeah. in the, uh, the, in the uh, Vedantic tradition, meaning the end of Veda, so all of these, uh, and in the yogic traditions, uh, the non-dual traditions of jnana, or wisdom, yeah. or pragya, or super wisdom, mm -hmm. is the, it's the main thing, and it's insight into the, the nature of uh, knowledge itself, that knowledge, you have insight into any particular knowing to see that it is basically context dependent or uh, a Buddhist would say empty of self, you know, there's nothing, or uh, if you don't like to express it that way, you could say, oh, it is Brahman, meaning that it is this, uh, essentially this joyous, conscious thing, not anything separate. And, but it's also the same, the same mechanism as this, as this insight. And in the yoga tradition, they, they like to say it's Viveka Kyatihi, which is discriminating awareness, mm -hmm. which is the d double-edged sword, same sword that Manjushri has. Patanjali has that same sword. Because, you know, when we do our little chant at the beginning of the practice, we go, oh, what's that? Uh, Shamka Chakrasi Dharinam. So Patanjali is holding a Shamka, which is the this divine sound, the Nada. When you find the conch shell. Yeah, the conch shell. And if you uh, clean out your nadis, then you'll be hearing Nada, which is purest <laughs> sound. Um, sound that just absorbs and makes your everything that <laughs> hard to explain. Uh, chakra, ch chakra is the the wheel of time, the Kala Chakra, mm -hmm. and so and then uh, Asi is a sword, holding the sword of discrimination. It's a double-edged sword because uh, you see it right through a subject, whatever you're looking at, you see that there's actually not a separate thing there. That it's all context dependence, uh, and it's just like. And at the same time, the, the subject, <coughs> theory of self, you know, that there's someone, that's, is equally as, as open, you know, empty. Same sword. They pass it around, I guess. Um, in, in, the, in the set of the paramitas, the transcendences, the wisdom, prajna, or super knowing, is the sixth. And generosity... Uh, ethicality, tolerance, uh, energy, uh, concentration are the first five. But none of the others can really be fulfilled until wisdom is. So in a way it's also the basis of everything, wisdom, different degrees of it. You know? And of course there's hugely many different degrees. Actually, and the word praja in basic, basic epidemic can simply mean intelligence. Because intelligence is the ability to discern like between yellow and blue, or you know, poison and good food, or you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. It's basically the ability to discern things. So I don't know if the Western word wisdom really gets it exactly. You know. But like, maybe it does. Does it do it? Does wisdom real knowledge, but experiential? Is that sort of what the? Yeah, and I think if you, you know, yes, from a practical sense, if yes. you are doing this kind of practice where you are thinking about these, this idea of discernment of context and keeping your mind open. Uh, we do the practices in part because we are trying to learn how to not go into you know, this, this nature of mind to just grab onto an idea and then stick with it mm -hmm. and stop having mm -hmm. an open mm -hmm. perspective. And when you keep the perspective open with discernment, then there is this potential for practical wisdom, mm -hmm. practical insight. And so, in a, you know, I think it, it could mean wisdom, 
Yes, well, the highest level. So yes. wisdom can be, okay, then we'll stick with wisdom. It's very established, anyway, for that But then immediately we, we come up with, oh, well, it's wisdom and the, the vision right. of the old man sitting there you know, yes, yes. under a tree. I know we do yeah. have that. Yeah. So, but we also have the, then how does the Gnostic tradition, the Christian tradition, does anybody know? And some people like to use the word gnosis for jnana in a spiritual meaning. Jnana can mean the most basic knowledge, just any kind of knowledge, dualistic knowledge. But jnana in the high meaning, people want to say gnosis. Some people like to do that. And then some people are stressing me out. I like to use the word intuition. Uh, because intuition is a kind of knowing that we have, but unless we especially train ourselves a little bit, we kind of don't know that we have it. And actually, it can be distorted and delusive as well as accurate. But it's very direct, and it's sort of beneath the level of our conceptual knowing. It's, it's deep, more experiential, more practical. Yeah, and, and intuition. So I, I, I like to use that word as a, as a synonym of wisdom. Yeah. Gnosis. Hmm? Intuition. Oh, intuition. And intuition. I don't really like gnosis because, because I associate gnosis with Gnosticism, where, which is very anti the body. Right, very much, you know, leaving the, it's, it's sort of very dualistic. And uh, besides, nobody knows what it is. It sounds, it sounds like a disease. <laughs> well, that's a prognosis. What? Prognosis. Prognosis. The, same as uh, the prognosis same is problem. usually bad. <laughs> <laughs> and the insurance industry is going to make money on it. <laughs> that's usually the prognosis, unfortunately. Although, if you know Greek, do you have any Greek friends? Any of you ever have any Greek friends? And visit Greece? Is it like a Greek family? What? Is a Greek person here? So I once been, oh great. So if you go for dinner with a Greek family or something, because you're a friend of some, one or two of the people, then they nicely will talk English with you because they all know English. But sometimes they will start talking Greek. And when I, you know, I feel I'm with a bunch of high-tech scientists and doctors. Because they're actually just talking about the salami or the salad, or the <laughs> but it sounds like that's it, everything is gnosis and dialysis and dialysis and dialysis. So you're getting there, you're really getting analyzed. <laughs> you feel <laughs> it's like our technical language, and uh, you know doctors use that. They take high advantage of that. You know, tell you you have a skin disease and. It's like a Moses, a Moses, a Moses, and then now it's five hundred dollars. They said skin disease. You wouldn't want to pay that much. <laughs> oh, that's idiopathic. What's that? That's idiopathic. And you don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I know. But that's the magic of language, which is the Davy. Yes. Oh, okay. Language, you know, and she's got us We're going right now. That's right. <laughs> That's the intuition and the okay. wisdom of the family. Yes, yes. So I'm curious about, I'm still back with the vowels yeah. and, and Manjushri. Um, he is also represented by the vowels. Yeah? By the what? By, by, by vowels. vowels. Rather, he's that one of the males be. that's... Everything is kind of, you know, can be assigned different ways for different contexts, but tends to be the, the male, the vowels. Yeah. So do you think then that he is, because we're kind of in this division between the feminine and the masculine, and so does he represent this unification? Well, he's the with he's that double-edged sword. I guess. Well, yeah, all of them do. <laughs> but uh, his his uh, female counterpart is Saraswati in the Buddhist context. So Saraswati is his female counterpart, and um, and so they you know they turn up in many in many contexts in the pantheon, so to speak. But um, uh, you know, the last few thousand years have been, you know, pretty much male-dominated in Eurasia. So, they've been emphasizing that, that, that even the male can shape up. <laughs> if they persist, <laughs> if they're lucky enough to have a good teacher. So, uh, I think it's interesting just the vowels and consonants. All right. What? Fascinating. Yeah. Like um, some some of you have come to Boulder. You know, we we love to. I love to like chant vowels. Uh huh. Sanskrit. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, uh, e e o o a i o a o a n a. Uh huh. Oh yeah. And then, but a vowel just can go on and on as long as you don't run out of breath. 
in, 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 in the in the in the in the Sambar, in the in Tantra, we also have er er and u mm -hmm. before we oh, yeah, have a i o r yeah um, uh, so they have four consonants which are the semi vowels yeah. in liquid e e a a e e er er u u u u and uh, the people don't really they can be vowels they call semi vowels right? so, yes they're wonderful. But and the then all the chakras, right? Then they add up all the petals of the chakras. When you pump up the number by adding a few things, yeah, it's not a they, pump a few things. they come up with like 60, 120, if they have the long vowels. You know, they have all these ways of adding. So that all your body is made of, of the letters, actually. It's like your genes are... The, and the, the, the gene only has four letters. The genome. The way they are looking at it. The Westerners. Boring letters, what are they? A, G, C, T. I always tell people who ask me, why are you why when you were young did you run off to India and do this and that? Leave Harvard. <gasps> why? And I always say I was looking for a sane alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> and then they look they look annoyed. <laughs> but you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G is like completely nothing. It's like what? A is not even A, it's A. B is combined with the vowel E. I only learned when I met Sanskrit that consonant has no sound. Try to make a sound without a vowel. Like G. All you can do is Any deaf sounds. No vowel. So they get so upset with me. I say, and then they say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, well a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. We feel we accomplished a great deal when we were in the second grade or whatever it was, first grade. But it's just completely senseless. It has no rhyme or reason. Labials, gutturals, fricatives, dentals, etc. Like, then Sanskrit is all... It sounds like a poop test. <laughs> that's it. that's all the gutturals those are called. And na is one of the gutturals. Na is the most back in the throat guttural. And they go right down. It's so organized. And they're borrowing. They know they're borrowing. Ah uh, uh is a hard worker. They're borrowing. Uh. And da 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 na cha 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 and all the palatals, the dentals, they're all here. So it's so great. And people, they, their eyes glaze over when I continue with it. <laughs> <laughs> I got tired of saying something about mysticism. And I got just to say, you know, <laughs> because there's this brainwashed thing in the West that we are the highest culture that ever existed, which is a bunch of nonsense. You know, you know, oh, I told you my slave slogan nowadays, yeah. now that I'm retiring from academia. Modern scholars of these ancient things, even of, or about Buddha, Buddha could not have been enlightened. He didn't have a PhD from Harvard. <laughs> so not possible. He was not a, like an electro, like microbiologist or something. Really. Anyway, so speech. So we have a little time. So we say, let's let's do learn one mantra tonight, just for good luck. Do you, do you want? Do you have one? Yeah, that's your time. Okay. Does everybody know the Tara Mantra? Well, let's chant it for a few minutes, and then for the last few minutes, Mary and Richard have something to say about something. We, we have a strict thing of, of ending at nine so that the early yogis can really get, them, get some rest. After nine is past their bedtime. Okay. So... Om, Om, let's say, Om Tari, repeat. And the tea is a very dry tea. Don't make it a wet. American teas, all American teas are aspirated. There's a lot of air comes out when you do tea. But this is a ta. This, if you do it right, there's very little air or none come out of your mouth. Ta. And that's why it sounds like that. Om Tari, it's a long one. Om Tari. Om Tare, Tutare, Ture, Swaha, Swaha, Om Tare, Tutare, 
Tara's name, Tara can mean a star, of course, in Sanskrit, but I mean, Sanskrit was always a literary language, never a colloquial language, except in sort of academies. Um, it, words have many, many meanings, the same word. But anyway, in, in this context, her name means savioress. She's like, a, or there is an English word called messias. Uh, messias. It doesn't look good on paper, it looks like Messias. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds okay, Messias, and uh, female Messiah, right? And uh, so, so that you're calling on her, Om Tara, you know, the Savior, uh, to save me from suffering. First Tara, you're calling on her to save you from suffering. So, Om uh, is A, ah, U, and M. Mm. O is A ah plus U together. So, Om is the body, speech, mind of all Buddhas, ah, u, um, mm. uh, and they say. So it's, it invokes the presence of all enlightened beings, and um, which are already here, actually, but it, it's our, uh, invoking them opens us to them. And then tare is calling her to save one from suffering. And then tutare means adds in and save everyone from suffering. And then ture means bright, Pretty damn quick, <laughs> right now, today. And uh, and then swaha means all hail. You know, as a greeting, like uh, it's all good, all hail, swaha, say good, suaha, literally, right? So that's omtari tutari. And they say if you if you practice that and you know Tara, then she present she infinite in infinite numbers of emanations. And she'll save you from eight dangers, which are being eaten by tigers, <laughs> eaten by lions, attacked by elephants, attacked by serpents, attacked by fire, attacked by flood, attacked by robbers, or attacked by a bad president, ah, king, <laughs> attacked by a bad king. These are called the eight, the eight great dangers. Then they have an internal saying, and I think the serpents are anger, and the elephant is passion, and their ignorance, and the lions, you know, it's a different, they are, they're all inner mental addictions, you know, mental, men, mental dangers. There's external and internal. But the Tara Mantra is really something special. Tara you all know that one now. So if you see a bear on the road here in Milan, just yeah. say, Om Tari Tutari, and then the bear, will, you can pet it. I <laughs> know <laughs> there's only a little teeny pair running around trying to get my garbage. It's so smart. If somebody unplugs the electric by accident, and that, that bear's right there. They like got like a voltage meter or something. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't come when the electricity is on. Okay, now Mary, you wanted to say something, you guys. Something special. Commemoration, meditation. We can do a healing meditation. Oh, we could do this baby. Oh, right. So, a couple of announcements. One is just in terms of the logistics of the program. A few of you, many of you, have been here for other other sessions of this course, and we have always had a Mysore program down in the yoga shala. And because of logistics, we're going to move it up here in the morning. But we're not going to do it as a strict or as an actual Mysore program, more as an open practice session, meaning I'm going to be there practicing and practicing alongside you. I will probably finish um, around 6 or 6.30 most days. And so if, I, if you're there and need some questions, have some questions or want some assists, 
I'm happy to help with that. Um, and but we part of why we did this, and, and then we'll practice until about seven or seven fifteen ish when the the guided class starts, and the guided class will also be here. And the guided class is um, something we Richard and I feel is really important for people to take advantage of because those, how many of you normally go to my sword type practice? So maybe about half of us in here. And my sword practice is wonderful. A lot of us, we do it ourselves, etc. And what that means is that you have, within the Ashtanga system, there are series of postures and you work on them over the course of several lifetimes, maybe. <laughs> I've been working on them for a long time and am a beginner. And uh, you, and they become a moving meditation because you're practicing in silence and you are doing the same postures over and over and over again. And you start to recognize that, um, that your mind plays a big role in everything. And in particular, in your Mysore style practice, in your movements, in your breathing, in your thought patterns that arise as part of that practice. And so by doing the same sequences, you end up seeing the differences not so much in, well, what poses did I do today, but in, well, what happened? What was my body like? What was my mind like? What were my emotions like? And then you start realizing that actually the practice, that form of asana practice, is simply there to allow you to meditate when you have a little bit of difficulty just sitting still. And so as you practice more and more and more, you start getting a more subtle practice that is more internalized. And so in the guided classes that Richard and I lead, um, we really work from that perspective of the internal forms. And the, as those of you who were in the class this afternoon, the interpenetration of the prana with the apana and the the uh, complementary opposites within each each uh, form that we may try to do. And so for those of you who normally do a Mysore practice, you're welcome to come and do a Mysore practice in an open practice format in the mornings. Um, those of you who are interested in what this form of yoga, Ashtanga yoga, Vinyasa yoga is about with the Mysore practice, um, I will be available um, and I, I've been thinking about it, and we can kind of decide tonight, but whether I should... I, I think what I would recommend is that if you haven't practiced that form and you're interested in what it is, that you might tomorrow come and just sit and watch for part of the class or for part of the open practice session. In other words, you might come to the studio here or to the conference center at, say, anywhere between 6 and... 6.30s, quarter to seven, just to see what people who do this form of practice are doing. It's in silence, and you could just sit in the back and just see that this is what it's like. And then from um, Tuesday onwards, I will stop and be available to have anyone who wants to experiment and say, well, maybe I'd like to figure out what kind of self-practice I could develop. Um, we'll work in a corner of the Mysore room um, and Michelle Lowe, who's here, who's worked with us a lot, who's been to the Kala Chakra with Bob, um, at, will be available some of these days also to help with people who might have questions on how do I start my own self-practice. Does that make sense? And then we really encourage you to come to this, to the guided classes, because the guided classes with Richard um, and I will kind of expand over the course of the week. And they'll start off slow, but they'll build, depending on how the group goes. And it's an opportunity to, to go deeply and to see some of the, the deep patterns within your practice that you either have habituated to or also things that uh, might really trigger a deepening within the practice. So we don't want to set them up as um, two forms of separate practice. They really are the guided practice and the Mysore style practice, the open practice. We really see them as one. And with the Mysore style open practice, you could come anytime 
if you want to stay tonight and just practice until 7.15 tomorrow. <laughs> and I'll probably show up around 5 in the morning. And you could come any time until, you know, quarter to 7. And then at 7.15, we'll begin the guided class. Okay? And uh, we're available for questions on the asana and all of that. And then we have um, sitting meditation and chanting and lecture with Bob and then this sort of format in the evenings. So it's a full week and really it's yeah, Michael my, was... My lecture you have to will be a bit meditating on Tara, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be... Not just lecture, but mixed in. Meditating on Tara, which is... A bit of ranting and then some meditating. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it truly, we, you know, I... I'm with Michael. We have to teach a little about wisdom and it's, yeah. uh, and compassion and this kind of thing. And then we'll do a little chanting and meditating on Tara. And, in the afternoon. Well, and then we'll come back to dialogue at night. And, and what about your friend down yes, in the coma? Yes, so the other thing that we wanted to announce, and many of you may know this already, but that our good friend and fellow teacher and yoga practitioner, Michael Stone, who is a Buddhist practitioner and teacher. And I don't know how many of you know him, but he's, he's from Canada and has been living in Victoria. And he, um, just a few days ago, was in town and passed out and went into a coma and has been in a coma oh since then um, in a hospital in Victoria. In British, Boulder? Victoria, British Columbia. Oh. And we've just learned this evening that he has been, essentially when he, by the time he got to the hospital, there was no brain function. And he, his wife has put out the announcement tonight that they will take him off life support tonight. Aww. So it's very wow. sad. And Nobody knows the cause or why? Well, they're trying to find out what happened. He's in his 30s? He, well, he's how old is my 40s. 40s, early, early 40s, 40s, early 40s, early 40s. Early 40s. Early 40s. Yeah, 40s. young brother is 39. So yeah, early 40s. yeah. So he's he's a wonderful man and a um, a strong teacher. And so they had said that he will be taken off life support between 8 and 8 p.m. tonight and 1 a.m. tonight uh, in Vancouver. So that would be 11 p.m. To oh, later. That's terrible. And so to just keep him in our minds and our thoughts and uh, it's a it's a confusing and tragic situation. It's terrible. Yeah. It's